Hi, my name is Professor Karis Thompson. I'm in the Gender and Women's Studies Department at UC Berkeley, and I also work with the Berkeley Stem Cell Center. My focus has been on the ethical, legal, and social implications part of stem cell research and stem cell science. In all the fields that have come from the breakthroughs in the 1950s in molecular cell biology has always had um, serious m medical and bioethics um, activity around it because it really is dealing with life and death in all sorts of ways. And embryonic stem cells are easier to obtain than most types of adult stem cells. Some of the misconceptions students had were um, the actual sources of embryonic stem cells. A lot of people thought that uh, embryonic stem cells were derived from fetuses or aborted fetuses. And um, in reality, these days, um, the only source of embryonic stem cells used for research is from in vitro fertilization embryos that were left over after the donors had used the original embryos. In the public at large, and politically in terms of the ethical debates in stem cell research, the dominant issue was the moral status of the embryo. Um, because embryonic stem cell research um, involves, in some people's eyes, the destruction of embryos. For some people, that's equivalent to abortion, and abortion is extremely problematic for many people in this country. All the cell lines we make are left over from in vitro fertilization clinics. There are families that have gone into um, artificial fertilization because they're having trouble getting pregnant. They have their one, two, or three children they desire. They have all these leftover embryos in the freezer. So the choice is to either throw them out or give them to research. And most people decide that the moral high ground is to use them for research. And you've got to understand that these embryos at this point are really blastocysts. They're little balls of cells the size of the head of a pen. Another major um, misconception is um, that there's really no ethical oversight to this and that scientists don't think about that. But in reality, that's kind of something we have to deal with every day and all of the research that scientists do has to be uh, approved by um, stem cell research oversight committees before they can actually begin on the work. I think it's much more ethical to test um, new therapies in a dish than in patients because we can grow heart cells. You can actually see heart cells beating in a petri dish or liver cells and heart toxicity and liver toxicity are the two main causes why drugs fall out of the pipeline. So what happens today, at very great expense, a drug company will take something to clinical trials in people, hurt some people because of heart toxicity or liver toxicity, and it gets withdrawn. It's a very expensive process, puts people at risk. You can now find out in a Petri dish that you shouldn't be using that, testing that drug. On a more macro scale, Orrin Hatch, Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah, very consistent in his right to life positions regarding abortion has come out very much in favor of this, feeling that the moral high ground is to not throw these frozen embryos away, but rather to use them to try to cure people. I personally think the most important issues are the following. Access and affordability of the treatments, number one. So the worst possible situation we could get into would be where some parts of the population contribute to funding this research, because a lot of it's paid for by taxpayer dollars. Some portion of the population has their body readily available to be used to set up cell lines, perhaps because compensation is offered in exchange, but does not have access to the healthcare benefits that the research itself generates. So distributive justice, that any piece, of risk, any piece of medical advance, any piece of scientific research as a fundamental ethical precept should be available to all. And any medical advance should be available to the sick, not to buy ability to pay.